Hey everybody, I'm Steph. I'm Michael. Today we're checking out Celtus. From Pythagoras. Yes. Uh, this game plays one to four players, and the box playtime says 50 to 100 minutes. And that's heavily based on player count. Yeah, for sure, because with more people, it's just going to take longer. Absolutely. So, uh, this uh, in this game, you are... Uh, busy trying to repel the Roman army and get druids and whatnot, which this is actually a little bit different than Pythagoras's other games, I must say, because because Pythagoras tends to do games that are centered around Portugal. This is centered around centered around the uh, Celtic uh, regions, where you're repelling the Romans and and dealing with uh, you know trying to acquire druids and farmers and workers and soldiers. In oh order my. to do those things, yes, <laughs> uh, and you're building citadels and everything. So if you enjoy um, action selection, work replacement sort of things, you're probably going to love Kelte. Now I'm, I have to say before we start playing that this game was provided to us by Pythagoras, but not specifically in exchange for this video. They know that we like to show you all the games. All of them. So let's go ahead and take a look at this fantastic looking game. A lot of color. It really pops. Well, I love so. that the artwork is by by the Miko, so he always just draws me in. Obviously, this cover is just amazing. They didn't want to ruin the artwork by putting the name of the game on there. So there it is, <laughs> right there. For those of you who want to know how it is written, and uh, you can't see the name of the video anywhere, there it is, right there. So, yeah, and apparently it's game number two. Game number two in the Pythagoras uh, collection. It makes me wonder. And I was like, well, was. what is game number one? Because there's nothing that we can see on the... I have to go uh, look. On the Pacello box. Nope. Um, Which is my first thought. And it. and Pythagoras had sent us another game, and we I was like, well, what's the number on that? Oh, it's number five, so we're missing <laughs> some, several Some games. in between, so we have to figure that out. The hunt is on. The hunt is on. So, I always enjoy learning Pythagoras games, though. Yes. So, setup for this game is quite involved, I must say. Um, the uh, We've got this board completely turned. This is the north, and this is the south. Uh, normally, the board would be rotated. However, there are cards that are along the north and south uh, that would just take up all of our play area. Yeah, so it just it looks better on screen like this. It looks better so. like this. And all of these cards up here, which are, um, what do we call those? The uh, do to do the progress cards. No, those are not progress cards. Yes, they are progress cards. Um, we've got one, two, three of them that are worth two points each, and one, two of them that are worth three points each. If you've got three and four players or four players, you're going to put out more. We've got those aligned along the left edge of the screen they don't necessarily have to be up there but if you were wondering what those little card slots are for that is it um, we've also got six progress markers you need nine for three players and 12 for four players um, and that is a count not only is it a countdown for ending the game uh, it is also how you are going to determine which of those progress cards are going to score and how much each of them score. So, um, you are going to place discs of an unused color onto the spots that you cannot place on in a uh, two or a three player game. You're just going to cover those up so they are completely unavailable. A three or a four player game. For, th for what? For two and three player? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And a four-player game, they're all available. Yes. You don't need to put the disc on there. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, you will also notice that there are little marks on the corners of these tiles. One is very light green. One is very light yellow. One is yellowish green. One is greenish yellow. So, um, look at the um, X or Clover, which both look also very similar. Uh, this basically denotes the northern region for the green and the southern region for yellow. Shuffle these bonus tokens and place them on the southern side and the northern side. Basically, it just ensures that there is a two on each side 
a bonus marker on each side, a three military on e a three strength on each side, and a a uh, one extra ability, one extra worker uh, token on each side, just so that there's not more both of the military on the north, for example. Uh, each player will receive uh, one of uh, these little extra tokens and one each of the farmers, builders, and soldiers. Looks sort of like a traffic light. Hmm. Um, notice that there are also nobles. We don't start with the nobles. They will start out on the player board. Now, if you look on the spots on the player board, there are spots that are marked with specific symbols. Nobles must go here. A farmer must go here. A builder must go here. Soldiers here. Builder, farmer, and noble. The other ones are pulled randomly from the included bag. So those will go here. We've already got them set up. Um, and you put all of the other tokens into the bag, except the druids. Druids are going to be based on player count. We have six druids in a two-player game, eight in a three-player game, ten in a four-player game. So obviously we won't need those. Um, the druid tile setup and the military tile setup is based on player count. Uh, and basically it is more or less the same for druid tiles and military tiles. You'll notice that there are one point tiles and two point tiles. For a two player game, you're gonna need one of the one points and two of the two points. And that is gonna be true for those military tiles as well. Uh, but you'll see that they have red backs instead of uh, the normal gray, grayish silver backs. Uh, you're also gonna put cubes of an unused color on the three and four player spots based on your player count. So those are gonna be unavailable to myself and Steph. Uh, this uh, action marker is going to always be placed in uh, what is the southeast corner of the map. Um, of course, it looks like northeast because we have the board rotated. It will always start off in, in this starting position. Uh, anything else that I have missed? Everyone is gonna get their player color, gonna put the cubes on the side. Uh, a, the strength marker, which is just a, yet another cube on the zero spot, and all of these citadel discs that are just placed in these holes. Unfortunately, it is not a double layer player board, so be advised if you knock this around, you will knock these cubes out. Now, it really doesn't matter where these cubes on the side are, but the strength marker on the bottom does indeed matter a lot. So be advised, don't uh, knock this around too much. Um, you're going to have uh, cards shuffled up and placed on the north and south markets. Uh, you will also be given five uh, player cards yourself. Um, and then you're going to end up discarding two of them when you have selected your leader. Uh, the leaders are uh, first created by uh, drawing player count plus one leader cards, and whoever goes last gets first pick. So I chose Avarice, which has a scoring condition. Basically, all of the leaders, they don't have a power. They just have an extra scoring condition. This one wants two cubes placed over here in the military regions, um, and I'm going to get one point if I have two cubes. Halfway through the game, I have to choose whether I want to flip this card over. And if I do, I must get four cubes to get three points. If I don't flip the card over, I'm not getting the points. If I do flip the card over and I don't get the four cubes, I don't get the three points. Even if I would have had the other side of the card, I don't even get one point. It is a decision whether to press your luck or go for it, or, or, or stay pat with what you've already got. So, uh, Steph has chosen Caractus mostly because the other leader card, um, Steph is actually going first, the other leader card dealt with more military stuff, and we she did not want to 
clash on that. So she chose this here. Uh, she is going to get uh, one point if she has at least three workers in her tribe area. Um, and uh, not counting druids. If she can get six, she could flip that card over and get three points. So that would be cool. Heroic Logic says that is a striking cover. It is absolutely beautiful. I believe that is it for setup. Um, uh, Steph has been given the start player token. This is called the Tutates tile. Uh, I love how Pythagoras tries to stay culturally relevant, first starting out with the Portuguese uh themed uh, titles, and now with the Celtic-themed uh, titles. This is the Tutatis tile that basically says uh, at what point this tile is passed and what happens. So, very cool. Uh, Steph has uh, that start player tile. So she gets to go first. Each round, players are going to perform one action. Uh, every time this action marker crosses the river, Going past this line, that is when we are going to pass this uh, to Tadey's marker. And basically, that is the end of a round. Um, there are going to be six rounds to the game, uh, meaning six times around this central island, six times crossing this river, and then the end game is triggered. So, what can Steph do on her player turn? Uh, she will move the action marker, and she must move it one, two, or three spaces. So if she moves it one space, she can take the actions here or here. Notice that there are little arrows pointing to this little island or this little island. So she can take these actions. In addition, because she moves one space, she can get one strength point. If she, it's all here. It's, for it's the, all here. Yeah. It's a little sideways for y'all. If she moves two spots, then she can take these actions, either this or this, and she gets no strength points. If she goes three spaces, she can do these two actions, and she has to lose three strength points. She doesn't have three strength points. Guess what? She's not moving forward three action spaces. Again, you choose one or the other location. Yes, you will only get one of those two actions. It's just at this space, these two actions are available to you to take. So, get a little caffeination going here. So, the second thing, uh, so the first thing you do, move the action marker. The second thing you do, is to swap a worker. Let's say that Steph moved one place and moved her strength marker up one. And she wants to perform, let's say she wants to perform this action. She can swap one of her workers with one of the workers here. And maybe she wants to do some building action. So maybe she wants to take this builder and get rid of this soldier, just like that. Now she has more builders in her little area there. Now, she does not have to swap. She could keep that soldier in case she had plans for that soldier. Third, you're going to perform the action, and this is mandatory. There are four different actions. You can farm at either of these islands, the North or South Islands. You can build at either the North or South Islands. You can battle over here with the military. Or you can recruit over here uh, where the nobles are currently. And you must perform uh, whatever action with where your mark marker is. Let's talk a little bit about each of these actions. When you perform the farm action, you're basically going to take cards on either the northern market or the southern market. Obviously, if you are farming on this island here, you are going to take cards from the southern market. If you're farming here, you're going to be taking cards from the northern market. Remember, these two spaces have access to this northern farming area. These two spaces have access to the southern farming area. 
the first thing you're going to do is you're going to immediately draw this card here into your hand. Why? It costs you nothing. Then you are going to claim a number of cards equal to how many farmers that you have um, either in your player area or in your tribe. Your tribe is this area where you can have more of these tokens. Steph, show uh, what a farmer in your tribe would look like. Oh, that's a builder, but sure. A Steph now has one builder in her tribe. This means she always has this one extra point for uh, for building. So, um, so depending on how many uh, uh, farmers she has in her pool of active workers and or her tribe, she's going to draw extra cards. If for some reason, let's say she swapped this out, she has two active farmers, she might want to take this card and this card. Or she could take just this card because these are these cost two uh, farming icons. Switch those back out for you, Steph. So that is basically the farming action. Um, after uh, all of the cards uh, have been taken, you're going to shift everything down towards the free spot and then uh, move everything down uh, towards the cheaper cards and then fill in the higher spaces. For building, it's still going to be on the North and uh, South Islands. You have to discard from your hand a number of cards of the color of the citadel where you want to build. This build action is building on these four citadels here. If you're on the Northern Island, obviously these four citadels here. So if you wanted to uh, build, whoa, if you wanted to build on this uh, teal colored citadel, you would have to discard uh, the teal colored cards. Now the colors are not perfect, however, you should be able to line up this, the Celtic knot symbols rather easily, especially this cool purple one uh, with the really simple Celtic knot there. Um, so on your player board, you'll notice that you have to get rid of, you have to get rid of three cards in order to clear the, uh, the marker from this spot. Notice it's got a little rip up three right there. So she's going to have to discard three cards of that color. For every builder that she has, she has to discard one card fewer. So let's say she got rid of that soldier and took that builder, as we mentioned before. Now Steph has to pay two cards fewer in order to build wherever she wants to build. So if she had access to this card, she discards it and places her citadel piece right here. I think it's always minimum one. It, it, it is always minimum one. She could not have a third builder and then not pay anything. She must pay at least one. Thank you for that, Steph. Yeah. That is a good thing to remember. Yeah. Uh, -da -da. Make sure you get your things back. I believe that's how it was. Yep. So, um... If you build the set... If you fill up the Citadel you get the bonus token that is next to the Citadel. And uh, those car the bonus tiles can be used uh, anytime uh, after you collect the tile. Uh, this basically means just draw two cards from uh, for free from the market of the region where this tile is placed. Um, oh, is it automatically? Do you have to do it automatically, or can you do it later? I cannot pretty, remember. You have so. to do it immediately. Oh, you have to. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. So, yeah. So, two cards immediately from this region. Uh, gain three strength points. Gain a bonus tile. Notice that it is add one worker of whatever type, or, and, and, or treat it as if you had one extra strength, or take an action anywhere you want. D doesn't matter where the action marker is placed. So the each of us already has that. It is a one-time thing. It is a one-time token. And just so I'm clear, it's not from the top of the deck? No, it is. Looking again, 
Two cards from the market of the region where this tile is placed. Wow. And finally, uh, this here is recruit one worker from your active pool. Recruit is whenever you take a car, uh, marker from your active pool and put it in your tribe. Very great. Which will bring us to this action, which is recruit. When you perform the recruit action, you're going to immediately recruit one of your active workers for free. Taking that worker from your active workers pool and placing it into your tribe. Then, for each noble you have, those are the blue ones, you get an additional recruit action. But they must come from your active worker pool. You then place them in the uh, into those spots, and ta-da, um, that's pretty awesome. Now, you're not going to be able to recruit more than three workers during your recruit action. Your active workers pool always has three active workers. So if Steph wanted to swap this out with a noble, look, she's still got three active workers. So at the end uh, of your turn, uh, after you have recruited and you have fewer than three active workers at that point, you are going to draw workers from this central island one at a time, Ticket to Ride style. Uh, you can't just draw from the bag, though, unlike Ticket to Ride. You must take one of these three. It refreshes. You take one of those three. It refreshes. And if you needed a third, one of those three. And it refreshes. Hmm. Um. In addition, in addition to putting uh, workers into your tribe, you can also fulfill one of the druid uh, recruitment things where uh, in the region where you are. So if Steph were here, she would only have access to this uh, druid tile. Uh, that is how you will, you basically are sending workers from your tribe to be trained as a druid. This one, you would need to take a noble and a farmer and send them off. And what will you get in return? You will get a druid and this one point tile. And those guys have to come from your tribe. Yes, they must come from your tribe. From this area. You cannot take them from your active worker pool. Yeah. It must come from your tribe. So... Let's say she does that. She discards the noble and the farmer. She gets this in exchange. This counts as one of anything. It's pretty good. It counts as a noble. It counts as a farmer. It counts it as goes a... against my guy, but yeah. It's yes. Pretty, still pretty good. Yes. Her guy is, remember, her wor her leader wants, wants workers in her tribe. However, it does not count druids. Notice the little moon with the little knot symbol next to it? That means no druids. I could still get two of them provided. Could, for sure. Everything up, but it's, it's hard. Yes. So, let's say you also fulfill the one underneath it once it is revealed. You cannot do that. You can only take the top druid tile and recruit one druid per action. Finally, let's talk a little bit about battle. This is probably the most difficult action. Um, notice that there that these cards that you discard for Citadel stuff also has a little line at the very bottom. Notice that this one has a little shield at the bottom, and that stands for warriors. Uh, the little Trojan helmet uh, icon means traps for some reason. I'm not quite sure. And then the little tower stands for... For fortresses. Put these back on the board. So, um, whenever you are going to battle the Roman army, depending on how many soldiers you have in your pool of active workers and or in your tribe, you're going to gain strength points for every uh, discarded card uh, that you uh, discard out of your hand. So, if you have, let's say I had three soldiers, for every card that I discard with the same icon, I'm going to get three points because I have three soldiers. You know, currently I only have one, but let's say I had a let's say I had a soldier right here and two more uh, soldiers, or a soldier and a druid perhaps in my tribe. I would have three um, 
three strength worth for every card I discard with this warrior's symbol. Um, you could get a maximum of four, as you can see down here at the bottom, for every card you discard, a maximum of four. So it does me no good to have a fifth military guy or fifth counting druids. And you're going to get that many strength points. So I'm going to increase my strength up to uh, whatever value. And uh, these tiles will never have a number over 12. So you're not going to need anything over the 12 mark here. Um, to battle, you're going to have to spend strength points equal to the strength on that Roman soldier tile. Hey, do I have seven points? If I have seven strength points, I can defeat that Roman soldier tile. And hey, I get to keep whatever strength points I have left over. Then I take that Roman army tile and flip it face down beside the player board. Uh, you're never forced to spend cards for this action. If I already had seven strength points, I don't even need to discard cards at all for this. I can just take seven strength points and kill that Roman uh, token right there. You're going to get one point uh, for this top one. The next two, which have two points each on them, are going to be a little bit stouter. So, uh, if you successfully uh, defeat the Roman army, take the topmost garrison cube from your player board and put it into the garrison of the region where you're performing the action. So, if I were here, uh, I would put it into this garrison. And, in order to do so, I have to discard a card from my hand with a military icon matching the icon of the space where I want to put the cube. It doesn't, the rules don't say that I have to discard another warrior if I just discarded warriors. I'm pretty sure you, oh, you do. I'm going to double check, but it, I do not see it on here. It says... Uh, you get strength points per discarded card. The icon means that if you have one soldier for each discarded card with the same icon, you're going to get one strength point or two strength points, etc. Um, if you successfully defeated a Roman army, you may place the topmost garrison cube into the garrison uh, area of the region where you're performing the action. To do so, you must discard a card from your hand with a military icon matching the icon of the space where you wish to place your cube. If you cannot... Uh, or do not wish to discard a card, you cannot place a garrison cube. And like like the Druid tiles, only one of these can be defeated uh, per action. Um, it does not say... Um, let's see. In the example, it says he discards three cards with the warrior icon to gain six strength points. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, after the battle, it says Alonzo can also place a garrison cube from his board into the garrison space of that region, discarding a card from his hand with a warrior or with a fortress because the other one is already taken on this example. This one here is already taken, so he could do a warrior or a fortress, but none other. These little ones with the question marks, they are anything, and those have already been taken. So, yes, you can. It can be anything. Yeah. So, good that we double-checked on that. So, when the last of the Druid tiles has been taken from a spot, or the last of the Roman soldier tiles has been taken from the spot, notice these four progress markers. You get to place one of these onto the progress card of your choice. If you were the one that took the last Druid or defeated the last Roman soldier. In addition, if you were the one who makes the the action marker cross the river, you can put... I don't think I did. Um, no. The person with the two Tades tile is the one who gets to put these tiles. Like, let's say I went past the river. Steph gets to put uh, this uh, progress marker onto any of these that she wants. Hands the two Tades tile over to me. Um, and then, uh, whenever we cross again, I do the same thing. I take the next progress marker off. I hand the two tile to so, Tatey's tile over to you back and forth. Minimum, we each get to do three. Minimum three. Yes. Six things. Yes. Uh, 
However, we could do four extras. To do extra. Right there. Um, whenever three of these six have been removed, we have to choose whether we're flipping our leader or not. Whenever the last progress marker has been removed from this progress marker track, not counting any of these, um, then the end of the game is triggered. The two Tades tile will have arrived back to staff because we will have each done this three times. Um, after all players have, uh, what? Sorry. Um, we're going to finish out that round. And then, starting with the start player, she will get to take a double action, basically a double turn, not just doing two things where she is. She gets to move the marker, take a turn action, move the marker, take an action. And then I will get to do the same thing. Doesn't matter if we cross the river anymore because there won't be any more progress um, tokens to place anymore. Um, but we might want to wrap up uh, certain things like finishing citadels to get other bonus points or collect other, or you recruit other people into your tribe, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, final scoring is going to depend on a lot of different things. Uh, notice the, the scoring right here. This is one of those three-point cards. If we have one progress token on this card at the end of the game, we're going to get one point uh, if we have gotten two, if we have built two or more Citadel tokens into this specific color Citadel. Um, it's not per Citadel. This one is just you're going to get one point, or if there's a second one, two points, or a third one, three points. This is going to be a rather low scoring game. I mean, remember, our leader. In our leader, him or herself, is only going to be one point or three points. It's not going to be a great deal. Um, the other ones described briefly, if you have three or more uh, army tiles, uh, defeated army tiles, you're going to get between one and three points. That's really hard. Um, this is not a Roman number four, turn sideways. This is a, if you ha have greater than or equal to the most uh, number of builders in your tribe, hmm. not counting druids, then you are going to get one or two points. You can either be first or tied for the first. Hmm. Um, oh, this says three players or more. Hey, we got to ditch that one. Uh, um, oh. We have uh, the most Citadel tokens placed in the Southern region. And the most bonus tokens taken. Oh, look. We've got more uh, building. If you've uh, built the most into these orange citadels. So this is not two or more. This is ha this is slightly different from this one. This is if you have two or more. This one's if you have a uh, majority. So it's a it's slightly different objective. Um, so you're going to score for all of your completed citadels on the game board, you're going to get one points for each of your discs, but only if the citadel is completed. Boom, I've built here. This citadel is not completed. Boom, now it's completed, and I'm going to get two points at the end of the game, one for each disc. I assume those goals still count for it, even if it's not completed, though. Well, let's look. Uh, yes, it does not say that they have to be completed citadels. It's just discs placed on citadels. Yeah. Boom, here. This is complete. I'm going to get a point. Steph's going to get a point. And if this were a real player, this brown player, the brown player would also get a point. And whoever closes it gets that bonus. Yeah, but that's not end game scoring. Nope. We already did that. Yeah. Um, you're also going to get a point for... All of the bonus tiles you collected. Look, ta-da! It's worth a point. Now for my next trick. Hmm. Um, you're going to get points, one or two points, for your druid tiles. And one or two points for the uh, Roman uh, army tiles. You are also going to get one point <clears throat> for each cube where you have the most or tied for the most garrison cubes. Here and here. Uh, 
<clears throat> excuse me, you're also going to check your player board and add points for all of your tribe spaces that have this dark green area. If you notice on this player board here, uh, there are three spots at near the end where you're going to get points if these spots are filled. It's spots four, six, and eight. Uh, you can never have more than eight tribe members. If you ever have a ninth tribe member, then you have to uh, basically discard them back to the bag um, at the end of the turn. Um, so you'll also get um, all of the empty disk spaces for your citadels. Um, not only is it outlined in green, there's a little point marker on each one of these. One, two, three, four, five spots. You must build them in order. You cannot build them out of order just to get the point ones. Um, you'll also get, uh, if you've placed all your garrison cubes, boom, one more point down here in the corner. Um, and finally, sum up your remaining strength points. And it is, if you look here, end of game, uh, your strength. Uh, you'll get five points per, uh, uh, one point per five strength uh, and remaining cards in your hand. So if I've got 12 cards, uh, 12, sorry, if I've got 12 strength points and eight cards, that's going to be worth 20 strength points worth of stuff. So four points after dividing by five. Um, evaluate the progress cards, get those points and score points. For your leader, that is about it. There is a solo mode that includes uh, an AI player called Solitarix. And uh, that is pretty much it. There, there are eight different leader cards. I can imagine that there might be a uh, expansion at some point in the future. That would be cool. Yeah. Uh, so that was the rules. Now, if you like this, we're going to do a playthrough. So check out the other video because we're going to play right now. But you're going to link below. Yes, I will, of course. So, and if you enjoyed this teach and you're looking for more just like it, hey, check out the rest of her YouTube videos. Or, hey, you can come join us on Twitch every Wednesday and Sunday night at 5 p.m. Central where we play and teach three games or more every single stream. So, hey, come join us on twitch.tv slash boardgamersteph where we play all, all the games. games. Yeah. And for those on Twitch, we'll be right back with the playthrough.